For 162 years, a single dam throttled the Kennebec, trading 17 miles of river life for just 0.1% of Maine's electricity. Generations accepted the loss. Then, in 1999, federal regulators did what no one had dared. They forced removal against the owner's will. 78,000 fish became 5.5 million. That decision did more than restore a river. It started a movement that is shifting the fate of rivers across America. What made this small dam's removal the catalyst for a national reckoning? Edwards Dam first rose across the Kennebec in 1837, a wall of timber and stone stretching nearly a thousand feet from bank to bank. In the heart of Augusta, it promised progress, a steady hum of water turning turbines, a new era for a growing mill town. For generations, the dam's presence was taken as a fact of life, its broad reservoir, a familiar backdrop to daily routines. But beneath the surface, the numbers told a different story. Despite its imposing size and the sense of permanence it projected, Edwards Dam delivered just 3.5 megawatts of power at its peak. That's less than one-tenth of one percent of Maine's electricity supply, a fraction so small it barely registered on the state's energy ledger. At any given moment, the dam's output could light a few thousand homes, but it never came close to powering a city. The workforce needed to run it was modest, just a handful of operators and maintenance staff. For most of its 162-year lifespan, the dam's primary role was to serve a local paper mill and a handful of downstream users, not to anchor the state's power grid. Megawatts feel small here. The dam's original builders could not have imagined a future where energy would flow from distant sources, nuclear, natural gas, wind, and solar, making the tiny hydro plant on the Kennebec almost irrelevant. By the 1990s, Maine's total electricity generation reached nearly 14,000 gigawatt hours a year, with Edwards Dam contributing a sliver, 3.5 megawatts, out of a statewide average of 4,000. On a pie chart, the dam's share barely formed a line. Even the federal regulators reviewing its license renewal described the output as negligible, especially compared to the ecological costs accumulating year after year. The dam was never designed for flood control or irrigation. It did not store drinking water or protect towns from spring melt. Its only real product was a trickle of electricity produced at rates far above market value by the end, locked in by decades-old contracts. Over the years, the dam suffered multiple breaches, with catastrophic failures in 1839, 1846, and 1855. Each time patched and rebuilt, but never reimagined. Its original fish ladder was destroyed long before the Civil War, and it was never replaced. The structure endured through habit and inertia, not because it was essential. Trickle is the right word. By the 1990s, the arithmetic was hard to ignore. The dam's energy contribution was almost invisible on the state's balance sheet. But the bill it left for the river was stark. 17 miles of blocked habitat, a vanished migration, and a local economy starved of its natural foundation. The power math was clear. One small dam, a century and a half of disruption, and a payoff that no longer justified the cost. 17 miles summed it up. 17 miles of the Kennebec River once pulsed with life every spring. Before the dam, millions of fish, alewives, shad, salmon, and sturgeon fought their way upstream from the Atlantic, tracing ancient routes to spawning grounds scattered deep in the watershed. For centuries, these runs fed not just the river's ecosystem, but entire communities along its banks. The Kennebec's annual migrations were legendary, a natural clockwork that signaled the start of planting the return of ospreys, the renewal of forests and fields. All of that changed in 1837. When Edwards Dam closed its gates, the river's migratory corridor snapped shut. For the fish, the wall was absolute. The dam's footprint erased access to 17 miles of prime habitat, places where gravel bars and cool tributaries had nurtured countless generations. The loss was immediate and total, no fish ladder, no bypass, not even a temporary channel. The original ladder, battered by repeated floods, vanished before the Civil War. Nothing replaced it. The river's great migrations collapsed almost overnight. The numbers are stark. Before the dam, alewife and shad runs could number in the millions. Salmon, 
once so abundant they were sold by the barrel, dwindled to a trickle. By the late 20th century, only scattered survivors returned each spring, tens of thousands where there had once been millions. The river's food web unraveled. Eagles, ospreys, and otters lost a vital food source. The Kennebec's role as a nursery for the Gulf of Maine faded, with ripple effects reaching far beyond Augusta. For the fish that survived, the blocked river meant a desperate search for alternatives. Some spawned in whatever backwaters remained below the dam, but most found nothing. Generations of sea-run fish vanished from the upper Kennebec. The river's legendary abundance became a memory, passed down in stories and faded photographs. Local fishing families watched as the river emptied out, nets that once brimmed with silver now came up nearly empty. The collapse echoed through local economies, but the greatest cost was ecological, a living river reduced to fragments. By the 1990s, the Kennebec below Augusta had become a shadow of its former self. The dam's legacy was measured not just in lost power, but in the silence of a river cut off from its past. 17 miles of spawning grounds lay dormant, waiting for a chance to come alive again. In 1991, Edwards Manufacturing Company filed for a new 50-year license to keep the dam running. A coalition of conservation groups began assembling evidence, thousands of pages, scientific studies, economic reports, and testimony from fisheries experts. The case soon filled more than 7,000 pages of the official record. Each document weighed the dam's meager contribution to Maine's power grid against the devastation it caused to the Kennebec River's living systems. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, was tasked with making the call. For decades, hydropower licenses were routinely renewed as a matter of course, but this time, the law required a new test. Was the dam's public benefit truly greater than the harm it inflicted? On November 25, 1997, FERC issued an order that stunned the industry. License renewal was denied. The Edwards Dam would come down. This was the first time in American history that federal regulators refused to relicense a dam over the owner's objections, citing the overwhelming ecological and public benefits of a free-flowing river. The commissioners, after years of hearings and review, determined that the Kennebec's restoration was worth far more than the 3.5 megawatts the dam could offer. They made it clear the era of automatic renewal was over. Dams could be deemed expendable, even against the will of their owners. The owners and their allies pushed back hard. Appeals were filed. Legal teams argued that FERC had overstepped, that the order amounted to a regulatory taking, that the precedent threatened the entire hydropower industry. But the decision held. FERC's authority to weigh environmental value above private economic interest was upheld at every challenge. The removal order stood. The Kennebec Coalition's exhaustive evidence became the foundation for a new chapter in river management. For the first time, a federal agency declared that a dam's right to exist was not permanent, but conditional, subject to the changing needs and values of the public it served. A year after the federal order, the courtroom battles gave way to the negotiating table. The dam's owners, faced with the reality of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission's decision and the mounting costs of litigation, sat down with state officials and a coalition of conservation groups. The question was no longer whether the dam would come down, but how, and who would pay for it. The answer came in the form of a $7.25 million settlement, signed in May 1998. This deal was more than a check. It was a complex financial puzzle pieced together from multiple sources. The largest share came from Bath Ironworks, a shipyard downstream contributing as mitigation for its own impact on endangered sturgeon habitat. Federal and state agencies added restoration funds, while the dam's owner agreed to walk away in exchange for avoiding a drawn-out legal fight and the risk of paying for removal themselves. The final piece was the transfer of ownership. The dam and its license passed to the state of Maine, which would oversee the removal and long-term restoration of the river. For the first time, the state stepped in not as a regulator, but as the new steward of the Kennebec's future. Lawyers and engineers worked side by side, turning a legal precedent into a construction project. 
The settlement covered not just the cost of demolition, but also a decade of fisheries restoration and ongoing monitoring. It was a pragmatic solution, one that turned a bitter standoff into a shared investment in the river's recovery. With the ink dry and the money in place, the last bureaucratic barriers fell away. The machinery of removal could finally move from the courthouse to the riverbank. The deal cleared the way for the first breach, setting the stage for the Kennebec's long-awaited return to life. Just after sunrise on July 1, 1999, the Kennebec River's long captivity reached its breaking point. Along the banks, hundreds gathered, some with cameras, others with binoculars, all straining for a clear view of history in the making. Conservationists who had spent years in court now stood shoulder to shoulder with lifelong locals, city officials, and schoolchildren, their anticipation almost electric. News crews jockeyed for position, microphones bristling as the final safety checks wrapped up. A yellow backhoe rumbled into place atop the gravel coffer dam, its treads grinding against the old retaining wall. The operator paused, then dropped the bucket, biting into the concrete, one slow, deliberate motion. At first, nothing happened. Then, a thin trickle of water appeared, dark and cold, sliding through the new wound in the dam. The crowd fell silent, as if the river itself was holding its breath. Within moments, the trickle widened. Water, pent up for generations, began to surge. The backhoe retreated, leaving a growing breach behind. The river pressed forward, testing its freedom. Suddenly, a rush of water burst through, churning silt and gravel, the current roaring louder than the cheers that erupted from the crowd. Bells rang out from a nearby church. Someone uncorked a bottle of champagne, the cork arcing high above the heads of the onlookers. For the first time since 1837, the Kennebec flowed unbroken past Augusta. The spectacle was both simple and profound, a machine operator, a crowd, and the unstoppable force of water reclaiming its course. In those first minutes, the paperwork and legal arguments of the past decade vanished, replaced by the raw energy of a river set free. The breach was small, but the sense of release was immense. The crowd lingered, watching as the river carved its own path, the old reservoir dropping by half in a matter of hours. The Kennebec, after 162 years, was open again. Within just a few seasons of the dam's removal, the Kennebec River erupted with new life. Scientists counted alewives pushing upstream in numbers not seen for generations. Where only 78,000 had managed the journey before, the tally began to climb, first into the hundreds of thousands, then into the millions. By 2019, the annual run reached a staggering 5.5 million fish. Field biologists who had spent decades documenting empty waters found themselves wading through schools so dense the surface shimmered silver. The recovery was not limited to alewives. American shad, Atlantic salmon, and even endangered sturgeon began to reclaim their ancient spawning grounds. Ospreys and bald eagles returned in greater numbers, drawn by the feast below. The river, once silent each spring, now pulsed with the energy of a restored migration. For those who had fought to free the Kennebec, the speed and scale of this rebound defied every cautious expectation. Nature, given the smallest opening, surged back with overwhelming force. For a quarter of a century after the dam's removal, the Kennebec River became one of the most closely watched stretches of water in New England. It was closely watched. Each spring, teams from the main Department of Marine Resources and partner organizations set up monitoring stations along the river and its tributaries, tallying the pulse of returning fish. The process was methodical, with mechanical lifts, traps, and visual surveys recording the annual runs, while biologists collected samples for species identification and health checks. Data flowed into state and federal dashboards, then into peer-reviewed reports and management plans. By 2024, the numbers were unambiguous. Year after year, counts confirmed that the explosive surge in alewives and other sea-run fish was not a fluke but a sustained recovery. The same protocols that had documented the river's collapse now logged its revival, providing a record that withstood the scrutiny of independent scientists and skeptics alike. Studies published by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission and the main Department of Marine Resources 
left little room for doubt. The river's transformation became not just a local story, but a case study cited across the country as definitive proof that dam removal could deliver lasting results. Across the United States, the removal of Edwards Dam set off a chain reaction that few could have predicted. Within a decade, more than a hundred dams, some long considered untouchable, were dismantled in rivers from Maine to California. National organizations like American Rivers and Trout Unlimited grew from local advocates to the architects of a new movement, rallying communities, lawmakers, and scientists around the promise of restoration. By 2024, the tally had surged past 2,000 dams removed nationwide, each project drawing on the legal and scientific groundwork first laid in Augusta. The story of the Kennebec echoed west to the Elwa River in Washington, where two massive dams came down from 2011 to 2014, reopening 70 miles of salmon habitat and capturing global attention. In Oregon and California, the Klamath River project, launched in 2024, became the largest dam removal in world history, promising to reconnect hundreds of miles of river in a single stroke. What began as a local fight on the Kennebec had become a national domino, with every new removal expanding the possibilities for rivers and for the people who depend on them. Today, over 2,000 dams have come down across the U.S., unlocking rivers once written off as lost. As more communities weigh the value of forgotten barriers against living ecosystems, the Edwards decision ripples forward, proof that a single, data-driven choice can reshape an entire continent. The next river's future still depends on the questions we dare to ask. Thanks for watching.